The most disturbing nonfiction book I ever read is a book called Late Victorian Holocausts by Mike Davis. And he starts the book in the most unusual, unexpected way. I read this book many years ago and it left a big impression on me. I think about it often. He starts the book by describing the post-presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. So he had a troubled presidency and now he and his family being sort of taken, uh, sponsored in a way by the Navy and he has uh, a retinue and other sponsors. He's traveling the world. Ulysses S. Grant with, uh, with some reporters um, and like a kind of military escort. They're going throughout all of Europe and then after that they go to the Middle East and Palestine and Egypt and Asia and China and he's reporting back and there's all sorts. I, I had read a biography of Ulysses S. Grant shortly before I read Late Victorian Holocaust so I had some uh, sense of this history of um, the presidency of America and also of the world because it was this very incredible meeting of different cultures and uh, Ulysses and his wife they would do all sorts of um, and they would say all sorts of very awkward and comfortable things uh, to the royalty that was meeting them and, and lots of the royalty couldn't stand them and it was uh, in some ways comedic. And uh, Mike Davis, after going through this history, uh, finally gets to his point, explains why he's telling us this story of Ulysses S. Grant. Quote, What is germane is a coincidence in his travels that Grant himself never acknowledged but which almost certainly must have puzzled readers of Young's narrative. The successive encounters with epic drought and famine in Egypt, India, and China. It was almost as if the Americans were inadvertently following in the footsteps of a monster whose colossal trail of destruction extended from the Nile to the Yellow Sea. And it goes on to describe the absolute starvation, the bodies in the streets that Grant was seeing on his travels. Eventually, Davis sums up the, what was going on, the, these famines at the time in the late 19th century. He says that the great drought of 1876 to 1879 left an estimated 20 to 30 million dead. And that this was only one of three droughts at the time. Quote, the European empires, together with Japan and the United States, rapaciously exploited the opportunity to wrest new colonies, expropriate communal lands, and tap novel sources of plantation and mine labor. What seemed, from a metropolitan perspective, the 19th century's final blaze of imperial glory was from an Asian or African viewpoint only the hideous light of a giant funeral pyre. The total human toll of these three waves of drought, famine and disease could not have been less than 30 million victims. 50 million dead might not be unrealistic. He then goes on to talk about the question of memory and how thoroughly this history has been erased from our collective memory from the history books. And of course, that's a very deliberate decision. And, and he concludes this, this early section of the book where he's just sort of prefacing what he's going to talk about throughout the book by asking some of the core questions of this book. How do we weigh smug claims about the life-saving benefits of steam transportation and modern grain markets when so many millions, especially in British India, died alongside railroad tracks or on the steps of grain depots? And how do we account, in the case of China, for the drastic decline in state capacity and popular welfare, especially famine relief, that seemed to follow in lockstep with the empire's forced opening to modernity by British and the other powers? Those are some of the key questions of the book. And Mike Davis makes very clear, he says explicitly, that this book is a pointing of the finger. 
insofar as these famines are remembered at all, they're understood to be uh, meteorological phenomena, drought, things that are outside of the control of human beings. And Mike Davis is making the case, and he makes it convincingly, that these are human creations. Societies have endured drought and this kind of meteorological disturbances time and time again, and they have recourse. They have ways of producing other grains, other types of food that can grow in those conditions. They have ways of distributing grain, of stockpiling grain. And it was specifically the decisions of colonialist powers, the decisions of entrepreneurial capitalistic machines that denied people the ability to produce the kind of life-saving foods that they needed or to distribute food in a life-saving way or to stockpile food in a life-saving way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Davis writes, We are not dealing with lands of famine, becalmed in stagnant backwaters of world history, but with the fate of tropical humanity at the precise moment when its labor and products were being dynamically conscripted into a London-centered world economy. Millions died, not outside the modern world system, but in the very process of being forcibly incorporated into its economic and political structures. They died in the golden age of liberal capitalism. Indeed, many were murdered, as we shall see, by the theological application of the sacred principles of Smith, Bentham, and Mill. Of course, that's Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and Jeremy Bentham. For me, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez is many things, but it's also the experience of being on the receiving end of a colonialist project. There's a very exciting section of the book towards the middle where they describe Americans and foreigners coming to Macondo and bringing all sorts of technologies, laying down a railroad and day after day people spreading their wares and you have entrepreneurial people coming to Macondo with magnifying glasses and sensors and technologies and they're investigating the soil and looking at bananas under magnifying glasses and of course uh, a banana plantation springs up in the condo. And there's a tremendous confusion because the world is changing so rapidly and people don't know how to make sense of it. And some people see it as wonderful because the world is changing in, in exciting ways and, and the people are interesting and exciting, and it's, but it's complex and some people have reservations. And the story 100 Years of Solitude builds to a kind of climax a horrific climax. The banana company takes sort of total control, economically speaking, of the area. They become extremely important. And the workers at the banana company, they strike. And there's a sort of protracted battle between the company and the workers who want just sort of basic livable working conditions. And the banana company ends up opening fire and massacring uh, thousands of people in it open square, people who are protesting, striking, um, asking for the most basic of, of, of rights um, in, their, in their workforce. And this is actually based on a true story. In 1928, the exact same outline of what is described in the book happened in Colombia. In 1928, the company was called United Fruit Company. Now they're called Chiquita Brands International. And if you live in America, I don't know about the rest of the world, uh, they're completely ubiquitous. I mean, you see them everywhere. You know, I might uh, pack my son uh, on his way to school with a snack from a piece of fruit that is grown by the United Fruit Company, Chiquita Brands International. Uh, the massacre, of course, was carried out um, with the full endorsement and support of the American government, which had financial interests and did uh, tremendously uh, oppressive and violent things to support its financial interests and try to undermine any kind of popular um, social movements and 
uh, what, what Americans would blindly uh, dismiss as just uh, communism or socialism. Gabriel Garcia Marquez describes the massacre as follows. Suddenly on one side of the station, a cry of death tore open the enchantment. Ah, mother, a seismic voice, a volcanic breath. The roar of a cataclysm broke out in the center of the crowd with a great potential of expansion. Jose Arcadio Segundo barely had time to pick up the child while the mother with the other one was swallowed up by the crowd that swirled about in panic. The child's privileged position allowed him to see at that moment that the wild mass was starting to get to the corner and the row of machine guns opened fire. Several voices shouted at the same time, get down, get down, the people in front had already done so. Swept down by the wave of bullets, the survivors, instead of getting down, tried to go back to the small square, and the panic became a dragon's tail as one compact wave ran against another, which was moving in the opposite direction, toward the other dragon's tail in the street across the way, where the machine guns were also firing without cease. They were penned in, swirling about in a gigantic whirlwind that little by little was being reduced to its epicenter as the edges were systematically being cut off all around like an onion being peeled by the insatiable and methodical shears of the machine guns. And it goes on. I won't, I won't read all of it. When Jose Arcadio Segundo came to, he was lying face up in the darkness. He realized that he was riding on an endless and silent train, and that his head was caked with dry blood, and that all his bones ached. He felt an intolerable desire to sleep. Several hours must have passed since the massacre because the corpses had the same temperature as plaster in autumn, and the same consistency of petrified foam that it had, and those who had put them in the car had had time to pile them up in the same way in which they transported bunches of bananas. Trying to flee from the nightmare, Jose Arcadio Segundo dragged himself from one car to another in the direction in which the train was heading, and in the flashes of light that broke through the wooden slats as they went through sleeping towns, he saw the man corpses, woman corpses, child corpses, who would be thrown into the sea like rejected bananas. And it goes on and on, and he manages to survive, he manages to basically crawl his way back home to Macondo, and of course, no one believes him. No one, no one believes there was any massacre. The book is called 100 Years of Solitude. And for me, what I think that means is it's a meditation on all the ways human beings detach themselves from society, detach themselves from other people. The word solitude appears again and again and again, many times per chapter. Uh, and it's always, it's always a different lens, a different perspective. People seeking out solitude for its own sake solitude of love, the solitude of memory and nostalgia, and just all these things that consume us, that make us retreat into ourselves. And one of the most dramatic examples of that in the book is Jose Arcadio Segundo, who after this experience, someone who previously was so thrilled uh, and, and so full of life and, and exuberant about the uh, new people visiting the town, he becomes a shell of a person, almost like a walking dead and he ends up secluding himself in a room, um, almost invisible to other people. Jose Arcadio Segundo's version of events is not accepted by people. They don't believe the story. But the, uh, the, the accepted version, the version that's produced by the banana company is, they say that the union strikers have reduced their demands to only two things and that we will negotiate and we're going to come to an agreement and then there's going to be a big celebration after all this. And this, this guy is Mr. Brown, the American, who's, who's reporting on this exciting development in the negotiations. Quote, except that when the military asked him on what date they could announce the signing of the agreement. He, that is Mr. Brown, looked out the window at the sky, crossed with lightning flashes, and made a profound gesture of doubt. When the rain stops, he said, as long as the rain lasts, we're suspending all activities.
And it goes on to rain for four years in Macondo. And those rains wipe out. They start the process of wiping out everything in Macondo. And eventually, the culmination of which is the total destruction, the wiping of Macondo off the map and from memory and from history. And it's that sense of the infinite, invisible power of these processes of colonialism and capitalism and exploitation that I feel so intensely when I read this book.